I have the choice to say, got it, or leave meeting. So which one should I choose? <laughs> so I guess we'll begin. Um, <clears throat> looks like we uh, have a couple more folks coming in. So I'll, I'll just start out. Um, thanks everybody for joining us this evening. Um, I'm gonna uh, try to offer some um, information from my study of love in the Bible. So um, of course it's a topic that I have to narrow down a little bit uh, to fit into our class tonight. Uh, let's start with a prayer if we could though, together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for the time that we have with one another. I thank you for all that have, have joined and those that are unable to tonight. I pray that you would bless our study, help us to look into your word, help us to gain knowledge and insight from it. Uh, most of all, uh, allow us to open our hearts to it uh, so that we can be your disciples and, and serve you in a, in a more profound way, that we can, can reach those that are uh, that don't know you, that don't know the love that we experience as a result of being your children. I thank you for this life and the blessings that we have of being part of a family, and I pray that you would increase our, our knowledge uh, through our study this evening. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So tonight, uh, my study is on uh, love, and so, um, of course, First thing that I think about when I think about love is, is food. Um, but the love that we're going to talk about tonight is a little bit uh, of a higher order than that. Um, and so, of course, the, the, the word that I was prompted with was love, but agape, the Greek word for love. And uh, in order to try to narrow down a little bit of the focus tonight, I, I uh, am going to focus mostly in, in um, the Gospel of John. Uh, this word is, is used frequently throughout the New Testament writings, uh, hundreds of times, um, and, but John uses it more than any of the other Gospel writers, and he uses it pretty frequently in his, his letters as well. Um, so, um, you know, it's funny, I had this topic and was thinking about a couple of interesting things happened uh, that you tend to notice when you're studying a topic. Um, the first thing that I recall happening is that, that um, during um, uh, Mike Dublin's sermon on Sunday, he mentioned uh, being back at Brooks and how Ed Woodhouse had come down and said, I love you to Mike. Uh, and so I, I thought that was very meaningful uh, for Mike, of course, but that's what Ed does uh, and what we love him. We just love him for that. Um, I think also Ross mentioned some things uh, when he was talking about uh, asking people to raise their hands for different things and talking about uh, is there someone here that you have a profound fondness for or love for? Um, and so I, that was just interesting that those things came up as I was, as was looking into this. Um, what I'm going to do is try to share uh, my screen here. And so as you often do when you uh, begin a study, you, you uh, try to look at the definition of things. And so... Uh, I looked around and, and uh, I'm not uh, a scholar of, of really anything, but um, there were different things that came up as, we, as I looked at the word agape. And, and I'll just interject here. If you have something that you wanna say, please chime in and say it and interrupt me, that's fine. Um, but so these are some phrases that I came across. Uh, agape, the highest form of love, charity, love of God for man and uh, of man for God. Um, when you look into the gospel of, of John, as I mentioned, 
Um, John uses the term more frequently in his writings than any of the other New Testament writers, uh, 19 times in the gospel that he wrote. Um, it's frequently used by Jesus in his teaching and encouragement for the disciples, but also in references to those who would become disciples or followers of his as a result of the spread of the gospel. Um, it can be termed godly love, charity, sacrificial love. Uh, the connotation from the term involves a matter of will, purpose, and affection. Um, so um, those are kind of that's a kind of a summary of the the definitions that I found uh, as I look through things. But I do want to use um, a definition from Scripture with which we're all real familiar. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, and this is the term agape that Paul uses in his writing here. He says, love or agape is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And he prefaced this by, by saying, now I'll show you the most excellent way. Uh, so that, that is our definition, I think, a working definition of love from scripture. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we express love uh, as people and as followers of Jesus. Um, and when you read the passage in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, so the question would be, do, do I express this kind of love or that kind of love to the people that, that I'm around? Um, in my family, um, and then the second question, these are all things to think about. Do you express love verbally? Uh, that's not something that happened readily in my family. Um, my dad didn't say it that I can remember until he was uh, sick uh, and, and uh, going through Alzheimer's. Um, my mom would say it. Um, my brother and I never said that to one another until we reached adulthood. Uh, and probably at the prompting of someone uh, at church or my, my wife, um, I began saying to Matt, my brother, I love you. And of course, thankfully he responded in kind to me. So <laughs> that was a good thing. Um, but I, so I, I I, um, it is not something that a lot, most, like not everybody is comfortable saying it. Uh, and I understand that, but I also know that words are very meaningful. And so um, if you're not comfortable with it, uh, my suggestion would be to, to sit down in the front of the mirror and start saying it and say it repeatedly until you get comfortable with it and then start saying it to the people around you. Uh, because I think it's an important thing. Um, so, so you, and you can evaluate how, how important you feel like that might be. Um, so ask yourself this question. When was the last time you said, I love you to someone who is not a member of your family? Um, I, this has happened uh, among my close uh family members quite frequently, my, all my daughters and all of that. But I do have sweet, sweet friends uh, through church that say that, uh, and recent friends that have been to our home and said that on their way out the door. Uh, so the other question is, um, do you recall a conversation? And this is something that you might wanna talk about later. Do you call a, a conversation with someone other than a family member where you felt this kind of love from that person and what was the impact of that conversation for you over uh, your lifetime since that conversation? Um, so there's a, just a few questions to think about. Um, I wanna hop into uh, 
a little bit of our study, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how Jesus expressed love. Um, and all of this is kind of a preface to the conversation that I want to have about um, Peter's uh, discussion with Jesus uh, when he appeared uh, after his crucifixion. Uh, when he was raised, he appeared for a third time to the disciples, and, and P Peter and Jesus had a conversation, and that's kind of my focus for tonight and where I want to go with this. But um, as we read through these scriptures, uh, first one is in John chapter 13, uh, I want you to think about uh, Peter, uh, because uh, that's kind of our focus for this evening. And so in John chapter 13, uh, this is Jesus uh, speaking to his disciples, and I'm going to start in verse 31. Um, when he was gone, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I have told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you. And so the word agape is used throughout this passage. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So, um, Jesus, in that way, predicts uh, Peter's denial, but he has just come off of this new command that he gives, which is this word agape that he uses. Later in um, chapter 14, uh, Jesus is talking about those who would believe and obey. So if you go to chapter 14, starting in verse uh, 21, Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. And then uh, later in chapter 17, uh, verse 20 uh, through 23, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you, May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they brought to be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So there's that, that word agape again used there in reference to our unity, but also the love, the love that uh, God has for us and the love that we had uh, for one another. Um, so let me go down a little bit here. So now let's get a little bit to um, the conversation we read in in verse uh, 36 through 38 of John 13 about Jesus predicting uh, Peter's denial. I'm gonna bring out another Greek word that uh, is also a word that is love, uh, but the Greek word for it is phileo. Uh, this is 
is considered, again, in definitions, brotherly love, an affinity for, a friendship, a fondness developed over time. In scripture, it's used in, in Romans 12, 10, be devoted to, uh, to one another in brotherly love. I bring this up because um, this is kind of an interesting part of the conversation that Jesus has uh, with Peter. So in this conversation, this is in John 21, uh, verses 15 through 19. Um, let's just turn there and I'll read the whole passage and then we'll go through it. Uh, so this is uh, 15 through 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you tru truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would, would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. So um, let's think a little bit about what's going on in this conversation. Um, there's, there's three aspects to this. There's the three questions that Jesus asks Peter. There's the three responses that Peter gives. And then there's the three responses that Jesus has to Peter when he gives, uh, when he responds to Jesus. So let's go through them. <clears throat> um, the first time that Jesus asks, uh, he, first he says, Simon, son of, son of John. Um, I don't know why he doesn't say Simon Peter. He just says Simon, son of John. Why doesn't he say Peter? Um, but he says, uh, do you truly love me? And he uses the word agape. He says, do you love me more than these? So what do you all think he might be uh, referring to when he says, than these? I've heard two things. I've heard then the other disciples or then the implements of fishing. Okay, all right. Um, you know, there's, there's so many rabbit holes to go down when you do a study like this. And so I got distracted by all kinds of words and all kinds of things. And so, but, you know, you, when you read commentaries, there's three common things. One is, do you love me more than you love these things around you, these fishing implements, this life of fishing that you do? The other one is, do you love me more than these disciples do? Uh, and then the, the third was, um, let's see what the third one was. Then the disciples themselves? Yeah, do you love me more than, the, than you love these disciples? Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> so so there's, there's speculation there. I think the, the, most of the folks agree that he's saying, do you love me more than these disciples do? And part of that is a reference to when Peter made this claim that he would lay down his life. So Peter pretty boldly said, I will follow you anywhere and I'll lay down my life for you. Uh, and so, uh, so that the implication that Peter had said these things, I'm going to do this. And then here he's denied uh, Jesus uh, three times. So the second time he says, uh, do you truly love me? And he uses the term agape. And then the third time he says, uh, do you love me? And he used the, uses the word phileo. Uh, so if we go to Peter's responses, 
Uh, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he uses the word phileo. Uh, the second response is, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Also uses the word phileo. And the third is, you know all things. You know that I love you. Also using the word phileo. So I didn't know, you know, when I thought to this, I thought, why is Peter not using the word that Jesus uses? How, what could be going on with that? Um, anybody want to speculate or, or uh, offer what you've heard before? This is Brad. I can speculate why he didn't use agape because uh, I think it would be intimidating to use agape for the master who has taught you what agape is because, you know, I think for myself, I don't love you that purely. How can I love you that purely? Not the, not as pure as you love me. Right. That that's a good that's a good observation. Um, anybody else? Yes, I I had a a comment. Yeah. It seems it it seems to me that when the Lord was asking uh, asking Peter uh, if he loved him. What he was getting at was the uh, hardships that Peter and all the other apostles would be going through later on. Uh, in which case, if they held fast to their faith, and that would show true love, and which is why it seems to me why he repeated it uh, uh, three different times because. Um, uh, Peter was saying, yes, I love you, as though it was a matter of fact, but what the Lord was saying, uh, if you love me, then are you going to uh, sacrifice your life? Are you going to give up your life for me? Okay. And uh, Yeah, I, I think um, it's important to think about the dynamics that are going on in this moment between Peter and Jesus. Um, I don't know, you know, there were two other post-resurrection appearances prior to this one. I don't know if they had a chance to, to chat <laughs> during those. But, but what's recorded by John is this moment. I don't know whether this is a, a uh, so John records it. So I don't know whether he overheard it or Peter told him about it later or how that works or whether this is just a moment that Jesus and Peter had together and the disciples were not standing around. But whatever the circumstance, Peter is standing in front of uh, the Son of God and, and having come out of a situation where he denied him after professing that he would lay down his life for him. And so the, the, the I don't know whether it's discomfort or, or angst that Peter might have been feeling in this moment about what is going to happen here? What is he going to say to me? Peter having to humble himself after, after really messing up uh, and, and that being known by his brothers that were around. Uh, and so um, he uses this term phileo and I'm thinking to myself, this is, this is Peter using the term that might be most comfortable for him to use. Um, maybe it's a term that he was most familiar with using. It doesn't mean that phileo is a lesser form of love than agape is. They're both equally, um, um, have equal gravity and weight, I think. Some call agape the higher form of love, and I, I can accept that that may be the case, but these are both high, high things to say to somebody. It's not just, I love, you know, Krispy Kreme glazed apple pies. It's more than that, which I do love those. Um, so basically, Peter is using a term that is most comfortable for him uh, in this moment, and in a very... Uh, uncomfortable moment for him, uh, but in a very restorative moment for him uh, as well. Interestingly, uh, 
Peter uses the term, you know, uh, three times here. The first uh, couple of times the word for know is oida or O-I-D-A. Uh, and it's basically um, means to know a fact. Okay. The third time he uses a different word. Uh, it's um, genoisko, I think, G-I-N-O-S-K-O. -O, and the O's have one of those little lines over them. Somebody that's had Greek can pronounce that for me. Um, but that is more that it's beyond knowing a fact, it's knowing something from experience. And it's interesting that, that Peter says, Lord, you know all things. And so I think about, you know, inevitably what you think about is the times that you have in your, in your way sinned or denied Christ or denied, um, you know, fallen short of what he would have us do, fallen into sin, temptation, all those things. And you, um, as a Christian, as someone who is walking in the light, you are drawn back to God by that Holy Spirit that's inside of you. And you say, you know, the Lord knows that I love him. He knows that I've been baptized. I've been saved. I'm in, I'm, I'm walking in the light. I know that God loves me uh, and he knows all things. So he knows what my heart is and he knows that I don't want to do these things anymore. And so in some ways, this is Peter, but also in some ways, this is us. In those times where we fall into sin and temptation. Uh, so, um, any any comments from that that you'd like to share? Mike, I have a comment. I don't know if it's specifically related to this passage, but it's interesting to me that God made it a command to us. He didn't make it optional. He wanted us to do it so badly, and he knew we wouldn't on our own that he commanded us to love each other. I find that very, very convicting that we are commanded by him. And when we don't, we are not following his commands. Right, right. Oh, that's such a, an important uh, thing that you've said, Ruth. Um, you know, the, the um, and so in, in light of that command, when you think about the way that Paul describes love, as, as always protecting. So if I am to always protect you because of love, that's what that love means, um, then I, I am there for you in any circumstance. And I'm protective of your heart. I'm protective of your walk with Christ. Uh, I, am, I am there to love you in that way and encourage you in that way. Uh, and that is, that is my duty. That's, that's what I'm called to do, what, what we've been commanded to do. So that's, that's an important comment. We thank you. Uh, other Mike, Mike, I have a, like a question. Not like a question. It is a question. Okay. I'm, I, it just occurred to me. So if we're commanded to agape love, are we also commanded to phileo love, or however you pronounce it? Because it seems to me that the phileo is more affectionate. Like I might say to my wife, I phileo. Right, <laughs> right. Whatever. Yeah. So, um, Eros, he says. So, I mean, so there is instruction uh, throughout um, the New Testament writings that uses the word phileo as well. So in, as a, the verse that I mentioned in, in Romans, um, so I, do we go as far as, I mean, this is instruction to uh, followers of, of Jesus and to love in that way. So if you call that a command, 
Um, it's, um, let me just go back to where that was, where did I have that? Yeah, Romans, Romans 12, uh, verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. So the, the word there is phileo. So, I mean, it's ask, it's telling us to be devoted. So I, you know, I, I, I'm going to go with, yes, that's a command. Uh, that would be my thought about it. Um, any other uh, comments about what we've said so far? Well, this, this is Jim. Hey. Uh, I, I've always, you know, I, I agree with her. My understanding has been what was just said about the phileo being more, more of a, an affectionate kind of love. And I can agape my brothers and sisters by being concerned about their welfare, but I'm not going to phileo all of my brothers and sisters. I'm not going to feel a tenderness and a, the same that I feel for my wife. And, and, I, and I think about uh, Philippians 2, where we're given the admo admonition to do nothing from selfish, selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than ourselves. Let us look not only to our own interests, but to the interests of others. And to me, that's agape. My under, at least the understanding I've had of agape. Right. I don't, I don't have to have tender affection for you to be truly concerned about your well-being as a brother. Uh, and so I'm, I might be being a little contrary here, but I mean, I, I, I see a distinction between those two. And, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, I get what you're saying and I don't, I don't know that, um, so I, I, I'm feeling like maybe in my mind, there might be a little bit more depth to the word of phileo than beyond just affection. Um, and, um, but I, I, you know, I, again, you know, I, I went down a bunch of rabbit holes and maybe I missed that one. <laughs> so, Mike? Yeah. Uh-huh. This is Calvin. I, I just want to um, just throw out a, a friendly challenge to, to that last statement, because I, I really do think that as we grow to have relationships with one another, that phileo, um, which is different from eros, right? We're, you know, we talk about different love and yes, I have an affection for my wife, um, but I can have phileo for her and for others, but she's the only one I have eros for. Right. Um, so when we talk about that, kind, I think we may be using affection differently, but I think we do need to get to the point where our relationship with one another does reach a point where phileo, in addition to agape, um, and it's also demonstrated every time he asked uh, Peter if he loved him, whether he was using agape and then the last one used phileo, there was a demonstration of that. There was an act that followed. And we also see that later in the Corinthian letters and even further in the letter to the Hebrews where, yeah, they were showing an action in demonstration of their love for each other. And it was both with agape and phileo, which lets me know that I should have that affection for my brothers and sisters. It's not always the case, but that doesn't mean that we don't strive for relationships with one another to the point where we do have that loving affection. Like you said, say love, I love you to someone other than our family member. <laughs> um, I think that that first statement you made at the beginning of class really brings that into focus when we deal with each other on a daily basis. Yeah, good, uh, good observation, Calvin. And the, the, you know, the word that came up with phileo was fondness, you know, so if, if, if Paul writes, be, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, I don't necessarily mean that I need to be affectionate. Um, you know, I can go over and, and uh, rub Brad's bald head every once in a while just to tell him that I love him. But, but uh, I have a fondness for Brad Forrest, which is a brotherly fondness as well. And that's not necessarily affection in that way. Um, so yeah, good comments, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. You know, this is this brings to mind some of the things I was thinking about when you first started this lesson on love is that people express love in different ways and people receive love as an expression in different ways. You know, that book, The Five Languages of Love, 
you know, acts of service and words and um, touch and those kinds of things. And I think Calvin's point is well taken that in, in demonstrate, Jesus described, and he is in our example, in love. He said, love one another as I have loved you. And there, the love is in action. And if feelings follow, you can't always dictate your feelings. But, but the action towards preferring our brothers and sisters and uh, doing nothing from selfish ambition and being humble with each other those are all actions and they can be done whether or not I have a particular tender feeling or not. Right. And again, the example is Jesus and the purpose is to glorify God. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much. Mike, Hi, David. Mike. Hey, David. Uh, not uh, thinking about the words um, Eros, uh, Phileo and Agape, but I've always wondered in this ch 21st chapter, why, uh, why Jesus didn't say the same thing he did in chapter 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. Is it so, is it, could it be that he knew that Peter was keeping the commandments, but he just wasn't feeding, uh, he didn't have the, the desire to feed the sheep as he thought, Christ's followers, as he thought, as Jesus thought he should. I just wondered why Jesus, why Jesus never said, remember what I said before? If you love me, keep my commandments. Right. Yeah. That's what I, all I want to say about that. Yeah. Well, so, so, and then, you know, we transition uh, from, you know, the responses that Peter gives to the statements that, that Peter, that Jesus makes to Peter. Um, he says, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. And he says, feed my sheep. Um, so the idea of the first and the third, feed my sheep, basically that that means you're you as you're taking the sheep out to pasture and you're making sure that they get something to eat, that they're being fed. Um, take care of my sheep more implies uh, a responsibility and guardianship uh, for the sheep. Uh, in any event, um, I think Jesus is completing this reinstatement of Peter by saying, you know, now that I've asked you these questions, this is what I need you to do. And, and I am, I'm done with your denial of me. That's no longer there. It's gone. And, and this is your focus now um, to take care of my sheep. Um, and then he, he, uh, after saying the feed my sheep this, this last time, uh, he uh, essentially prophesies about the manner of death that, that Peter would endure. Uh, and of course, Peter can't, couldn't help but know this now and understand that this would happen. And then he says one last, he says at the, at the last, at the end of verse 19, he says, follow me. And the words that he's using there are keep on following me. So not denying that Peter was not following him before, but reminding him to continue what he was doing uh, with these additional uh, responsibilities of feeding and taking care of the sheep. Um, so I, I think in this, in this moment now, Jesus has, has transitioned Peter out of this extreme discomfort about what he'd done and how this reaction would be to understanding now that that, that, is, that is over and now I have this, this job. Um, but Peter's not quite done. Uh, so so in, in, if you read on in, in verse 20, uh, it says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive till I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. 
Um, so, so Peter, you know, has had this moment and then he turns around and, and is concerned about John. And I don't know what the concern is. The concern may be, you know, what is, if I'm gonna be doing this, what is he gonna be doing? Uh, I'm worried about him. You've just predicted how I might die. I'm worried about him now. I don't know what it is, but Jesus is saying it doesn't matter. You know, that it doesn't matter about John. What matters is what I've told you to do. And there's so many times in our walk where we look around and want to see what everybody else is doing and what's happening with everybody else uh, as a means of diverting ourselves from, from really doing what we need to do. Uh, and that might be what this moment is uh, with, with Peter. Uh, any thoughts or observations about that or, or anything that we've said thus far? Hey, Mike, sorry, I couldn't get off mute fast enough. Uh, I, had, I had two observations. One was I, I, Jesus was sharing with him and three times he asked that question. Um, given, you know, I, I take this given where we are at Brooks, um, that in many ways he was, he was prepping him for that, that elder role, um, that leadership role. And we know later on, Peter becomes um, an elder, but he used the very specific language. Um, but not only was he telling them what to do, and I think the, the important thing was he was telling them how to do it. So he was asking a question about love before he said, here's what I need you to do with that love. Um, because they've been surrounded by, in the Jewish culture, a lot of leaders who didn't show a loving leadership. Um, so he was, he, I think in many ways, he was kind of prepping them for that. Um, that's, that's just, I mean, that's more of an aside. I don't think that was, you know, directly he's saying, I'm, you're going to be an elder in this many years, so I want you to know this. But I, I do think in all things, he was helping him grow in how he was leading, because we find out very soon in Acts that um, he stood up with the 11 um, and he showed love for the people there. But then he had to be reminded again in Acts chapter 10 of how to go about leading. Um, so Jesus was giving him not only instruction to love, but the instruction of when you lead, when you feed my sheep, when you take care of them, when you teach them, because that's what that second love was talking about, how you train them up and teach them. You need to do it with love. So that was one observation I had from that. Yeah. I had two, but I forgot the other one. <laughs> All right, thank you, Calvin. Uh, any other comments? So um, just as, um, well, a couple, couple things. So, so this idea of, of feeding my sheep, taking care of my sheep, um, do you feel like we have a responsibility in that? Or is that just the elder's job? Of course we do. Okay. All right. Okay. So, I, so a lot of times, you know, you'll read and, and because Jesus was talking to the disciples, someone might uh, interject, okay, well, that was only relevant to the disciples uh, that were there in the moment. Um, and so you have to, I think you have to look at um, the totality of, of scripture, but certainly, um, you know, if somebody asks, am I my brother's keeper, it should be a resounding yes, I am. Uh, I have a responsibility. I, I, I am responsible to be devoted to you, uh, love, to love you in a way that's protective, uh, to love you in a way that, that um, in my mind, is, that is, is verbal, uh, but, um, but at least is, is observable. So it requires action. Uh, not just um, not just words, but action as well. 
so, so yes, of course. Um, so, so interestingly, I, I've made a little bit at least of, of Peter um, using the word phileo uh, in his responses to, to uh, Jesus's um, questions. Uh, but um, in, in his writing in 1 Peter and in 2 Peter, he uses the word agape uh, pretty readily. Uh, and um, specifically in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 5, he says, For this very reason, make, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to your goodness knowledge and to your knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Uh, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. And so the word for love there is agape uh, that Peter uses in instruction. And the instruction is, is targeted toward uh, not being unproductive or ineffective uh, in, your, in, your, um, in your walk as a disciple. And so I just thought it was interesting that Peter would use the word there. But again, it's used throughout uh, scripture. And, and there are commentators that would say in John that, that John is using the word. Um, there's really not a difference in the words that he's using for love. Um, I mean, he does use a different word there, but, but um, he uses them interchangeably is what some of the con commentators would say. And they said, don't make too much of the fact that he's used a different word here. Um, and so there, there is that. So I, I don't want to make something out of uh, something that may not be there at all. Um, Mike? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, hi, it's me in the room. <laughs> As you've been talking, I've think, been thinking a lot about what you, um, some of the questions you ask about speaking and saying, I love you out loud to other people. And I, um, I remember, you know, my mom saying that a lot and my brother, my sisters and brother and I uh, saying that even as adults, it's, it's very comfortable for me, but I find it so interesting. I'm curious as to whether this is just a, um, a problem for like our culture that we have trouble saying it, or if people just in general all over the world, I, I wonder if in other cultures, if it's just not appropriate or or if people are more free to say it in other parts of the world. And I do think it's kind of interesting. My, my thought is, is it's um, why would this greatest thing that God has given us to share and to speak kindly to someone else and to share kind words of encouragement and to say that, that I love you. Um, why would that just stick in our throat? Um, this great, great thing that we have, these beautiful words to encourage one another, I find it interesting, um, get stuck there, like along with, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Some of these words are so meaningful for reconciliation. And yet, um, you know, if like we all do in, in our, our Christian walk, we recognize that there is a battle of evil and good. I find it interesting that, that 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 is something we just cannot seem to get over sometimes. And um, I wonder if there's something that's really working against us and we need to try to overcome that. And we have difficulty saying those hard words um, that can be so healing. I had one, I have two members of my family who I dearly love. And one time it was so painful for me to watch as one family member said, I love you to the other person. I was there at the table and the other person was silent. And so the first person, I guess, thought, well, maybe they didn't hear me, so I'll say it again. And the second person continued to be silent. I don't know whether they were uncomfortable or what, but I'm gonna tell you, it was the most painful thing to witness as one person was trying to pour out their heart of um, reconciliation because Maybe there was a lack of forgiveness or something going on, but it was painful to witness. And I'm, I guess I imagine um, God would feel pained um, if, we're, if one is trying and someone can't respond. And so I guess I'd really 
just like Mike, I would encourage all of us to, um, if it's not, I love you, work on other words of encouragement. And I'm sorry would be a good place to start as well. I think that one gets stuck in our throat. Just some thoughts. Thank you, Anna. And Anna, this is Donald. The, the emotion that you just shared brought back a memory. I was at a funeral and the person said to the casket, Mom, I wish I had loved you. I wish I had told you I loved you. And it just kept on. The person just kept repeating it multiple times. And you talk about a sad scenario. And I remember it at the same time, I said, wow, I'm glad I said it. You know, it was, it was uplifting, but I had to humble myself real fast because I had been around people that said real men don't say you love them. And it was more of a, a masculinity type of vibrato with them, if, if you will. It was just, I, I'm with you. It's, it is those type of situations that have forced me to be more open with that, especially leaving home for the first time and being far away and really valuing what it means for family when there's no one around and is challenging to make friends in a new environment. Thank you, Donald, yeah. So it does, I mean, it does uh, put you in a, a place of some vulnerability uh, to say the words to someone. Um, and, and so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to come off as saying, hey, you guys need well, to say this to people who are not doing what you should be doing. Because I don't know what to lay on. It can be difficult to say the words. And uh, there may be a lot of things that are behind that. That that. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's an expectation that we can place on other people to, to say, OK, this person really needs to learn how to say I love you. I think it's something that we reflect in ourselves and figure out uh, how we can say it, and if we can't say it, then figure out how we can show it in a meaningful way. Um, so, um, any, any other thoughts or comments before we? Uh, Mike, this up? is Sandra. Hey, Sandra. You know, what I would challenge each one of us to not to think about who we know from our family at Brooks who has slipped away or is not coming that we have not, but could reach out to and say, I love you. What can I do to help as far as they're coming back to Brooks? Um, we, each one of us knows people who have left. And yet I think a lot of us have been silent and not reached out because we don't wanna be offensive or we don't want to, um, be too strong about wanting you to be with us. But if we love our family, that's one of the things that we do, either earthly or spiritually. I, I appreciate your encouragement in that, Sandra. I, I have, have thought about that a bit, uh, as I think many of us have. Mike. And I, I think it is important to express our love and the fact that we miss those people as being part of our, our, our worship together. Mike? Yes, Joan. Hey, Joan. Hey, um, I have done that. Uh, what Sandra was saying, uh, I've reached out, um, you know, and um, it wasn't too uh, comfortable. In fact, I, I, it leaves me with a question, like, because I thought that at the time, you know, when the person was coming, that we had developed some type of... Um, family rapport or friendship or whatever, but then uh, it was just cold. It was, I mean, it just <laughs> kind of broke my heart to tell you the truth, but it seems as though um, they're, they're going or whatever it was just like uh, what they wanted to do and without question. So I just uh, left it alone. Yeah, I mean, so all that we can really do in the circumstance that we're in, and there, I mean, there are many people that have left and we don't know the reasons why, but all we can really do is say, look, we love you and we miss you. And um, I think that 
has meaning for, for down the road. Um, part of what Sandra is saying is that, you know, part of us reaching out is number one, following the command to love and being loving, but then also rec helping the person that we're saying that to recognize that, hey, um, this person still cares about me and loves me, is going to be there for me. And that may open a door later on when, when, uh, when they decide that, that they'd like to come back and worship with us again. So um, we don't want to we don't want to close any doors, even though sometimes it may feel like there's they've closed a door. Uh, we, we don't want to close a door. So, well, um, I thank you, everybody. We're, we're about a couple minutes uh, short of the end of class, and, and I sure appreciate. Um, hey, Mike, this is Ron. I'll stay in front of the camera tonight. Um, the, um, you know, I have this vision of this exchange with Peter. Uh, he was so impulsive, we see repeatedly. And then we see just after this, the reference to Matthew 419, follow me. And that's one that we spent time on earlier in the year about, it's about giving control to God, giving control to Jesus. And, and I think you've pointed that out uh, very well tonight. And, and love is, is another example of that. If love starts with us as individuals, it will always fail. If love starts from the Father, then that's love that will not fail. And I think, you know, when I look at him, he's saying, follow me. This is to a guy that is already following him. Right. It's that reminder that you're giving us tonight that we start with God and then the love for others was, will come out of that, be a fruit of that love that we have for God. Anyway, thank you for the topic. Tonight. Thank you, Ron. Thank you so much. Um, all right, Mike, everybody. Oops. Mike? Yeah. Honey, I'm sorry to bother. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, well, I assumed that you were going to say a prayer and that we're going to include Bill. But mm -hmm. I, I'm looking out our front window here and an ambulance is attending one of our neighbors. And um, I don't know what the situation is, but if you wouldn't mind praying for our neighbor across the street. I sure will. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let, let's uh, pray together, everybody. Uh, thank you again. Um, Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for um, all that you bless us with and being together and sharing from your word and from the meaning that it holds for us. Uh, I pray that you would watch over our brother Bill as he's dealing with some health issues. And I pray that you would bring healing to him I bring comfort and rest right now for him tonight so that he can rest well and allow the treatment to work so that he can um, be restored to health. I pray that you watch over our neighbor uh, who is going through a crisis currently, and I pray that you would intervene in that situation and bring uh, them to health and healing, allow the people that have come to respond to the crisis to uh, work uh, and do what they do to help uh, them and allow us as their neighbors to reach out. Uh, this life is a blessing to us. Uh, your words are rich in meaning uh, and depth. I pray that you would take uh, us from this time together, uh, allow our hearts to be changed and opened uh, to your calling, recognizing that your spirit lives within us. Help us to be your servants in all that we do. We look forward to the day when we can be all together in heaven, praising your name. Until then, keep us within your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Good night, Bill. If Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night, oh, Mike. Still Mike. Still <laughs> Mike. Bill is online. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you, Bill. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thank you, Bill. <laughs>